So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Vink, and I'm the president of the Goldmine Project. As you may know, the Goldmine Project exists to provide encouragement to the many people that are involved in a career transition. We strive to pr provide resources for you so that are helpful in your, uh, in your job search. Uh, today, we are joined by John McConnell. Uh, John is the founder of Buoyancy Works. It's a technology company that leverages behavioral insights and machine learning to simplify and support major career and life transitions. Uh, John is a behavioral scientist and an engineer. Um, so you'll hear a bit about his story. He has over 24 years of experience in energy, technology, and consulting. And right now his research is on unemployment and volunteerism. Um, he has a focus on the approach and also avoidance. So we are recording this session today. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. And also at the end of John's presentation and before the Q&A, uh, have a short poll for you. It should take you about a minute to complete. And um, looking forward to a great session with John. Take it away, John. Thanks very much, uh, Andrew, for that very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to uh, yourself and to Allison and uh, all of the folks at the Goldmine Project for having me here today. Uh, really excited about it. Uh, and thanks to all of you online who have uh, taken the time to join us. Uh, I hope there's something in here for, uh, for each of you. Um, so let's dive right in. Uh, today we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, what it looks like when you start to look for job opportunities and you inadvertently end up playing Candy Crush instead. Uh, and diving into kind of the behavioral science behind all that as it relates to motivation and distractions uh, and, and other related things. Um, but before we get into that, uh, when we were chatting, Andrew and Alice and I were chatting about today, they thought that my career journey was, was interesting and worth sharing. Uh, I'm, I'm not completely sure, but happy to go, uh, to go through that. If I was better at graphics, this would have like an Indiana Jones plane that would fly us through the whole, uh, whole process, but uh, that's not me, so no such luck. Um, but essentially, it's a snapshot of my career journey in uh, just a, a few colored lines. I came out to Calgary in 97 uh, to work in oil and gas as a consulting engineer. I didn't really know very much about oil and gas. Um, my first experience was actually about 18 months later in 99 when the oil price hit, uh, hit $9. Um, probably a pretty familiar experience for folks who were around at the time. And I thought that was it for my career in the patch. Uh, so I jumped over into a tech startup with, uh, with some buddies. And for those of you who know your history, um, the year 2000 was a pretty dark year for uh, tech and tech startups. And so we shut things down fairly quickly thereafter. And all of a sudden the patch didn't, didn't look so bad. Um, my former boss at the consulting company suggested that I needed to go out and get some field experience. So in uh, 2000, I joined Schlumberger and was transferred down to Laredo, Texas, uh, right on the US-Mexico border um, to run a wireline logging unit for a couple of years. And that was a really great experience. At around that two year mark, uh, Schlumberger decided that peak oil was on the horizon and they were going to invest in a technical and business consulting arm. And they asked for volunteers to join. So as I was interested in tech, it seemed like a pretty natural no-brainer and I, I went for it. Uh, and we moved to Houston. Our daughter was born in about 2003. Uh, so we wanted to return back to Calgary to raise our family. And we returned back in, in 2004 uh, and take on some new work challenges and managing a team there. But looking for a little more kind of work-life balance I jumped over to a small company in 2006 called Intero uh, to work in reserves and budget planning software called Mosaic that some of you might be familiar with. And that really set the stage for me to move into EMP proper. I guess a chance to eat my own dog food. 
Uh, and in 2011, I jumped over to run the budget and planning team at Pengrove. Um, that also, I would say, set the stage for what I call the end of Act One uh, with a layoff in, in 2015. So <laughs> me being an engineer, this is kind of my engineer's view of Act my act one, now what process? You know, I sat down and I said, okay, well, these are all the roles I've had. These are all the things that I've done, or at least the skills related to uh, each of those roles. And I've dabbled in engineering and tech and a little bit of sales and marketing and customer service, some budget and planning. Uh, so like many of, you, many of you, I asked the question, now what? Well spent some time doing a deep dive into renewables and uh, I said, well, that, well, that would make sense. It's, it's energy focused. I could probably apply some of my budget and planning piece. Uh, but in and around that same time, I, um, I went through a career counseling process with a firm here in town. And I started to realize that really I was industry agnostic and for me, it was really about uh, the people and why they do the things that they do. It was uh, trying to understand why individuals would say they would do one thing, then do something different or do nothing at all. Trying to understand why we had all these processes and why oftentimes people wouldn't use them. And that to me was the catalyst to uh, go over to, well, actually back and forth, uh, to the London School of Economics in the UK to take my master's in behavioral science. And uh, as Andrew talked about, my research focus was on activating unemployed job seekers and volunteerism. That latter experience in, uh, in 2015, and I think a lot of you will probably uh, agree with me, um, that was as as somebody who, who last had this experience almost uh, 20 years ago, the 2015 experience was quite different for me. Uh, spending time uh, with other individuals who had poured, you know, 30 years of their career into a company and a fairly narrow frame of, um, of expertise were all of a sudden feeling uh, quite... Um, quite isolated and quite anxious about, about what was next. So that really drove the, the my research focus. Um, so if, <laughs> so that was kind of it about, about why and, and how I got here. If you've got questions about that career path and, and choices and things like that, let's save them for the Q&A at the end and we can chat or uh, you guys can, I'm happy for anybody to give me a, a shout and we can chat about that journey one-on-one uh, -on -one as well. But for now, let's dive into the main um, thrust of our conversation here. And that is really focused on what happens when you start to look for opportunities and end up playing Candy Crush. So today we'll talk through three things. One, motivation why it fluctuates up and down, why there's an elephant in your brain and related behavior changes, and the impact of job loss and the scarcity trap. We'll also talk about three ways to move forward by increasing bandwidth, shaping the path forward, and reevaluating stress. So it's important, I guess, uh, to, to clarify from a context perspective. As a behavioral scientist, I, I I think about how interventions might work at scale. Uh, so not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. I'm happy to have conversations with folks one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm not a career counselor and I am, uh, I'm not a career psychologist or a psychologist. So I understand the broad uh, behavior around these things, but um, uh, I guess take these in the spirit that they're intended as me sharing information and not necessarily as direct guidance as a, uh, as a psychological expert. Okay, so that's kind of the frame of the discussion, but we'll start with a short story about Rebecca. 
Uh, Rebecca has been away for work from work for about three months and has been looking for for and applying for jobs on and off through that period. Uh, Rebecca's motivation is pretty high. This week she's determined to get back to her search and she's ready to get after it. So she picks up her phone, intending to check her emails for her job listings. But Siri enough, Siri was kind enough to suggest Candy Crush. She opens up the app. She's mildly aware of what she's doing. Um, and really, somewhere in the back of her mind, she's saying it's only a one quick, quick round. But as she runs out of her five lives and three bonus lives, she realizes that an hour and a half has gone by. She has no idea where the time went. As she shuts down the app, the consequences of her actions start to bear down on her. She feels negatively about her choice and her actions, and she can't understand why she can't get it together. She tries to get herself back into her job search, but her heart just isn't in it, and her motivation wanes. She feels horribly discouraged and doesn't understand why she can't get herself focused and into action. Okay, so let's see how this works. So in the corporate world, uh, we grew up thinking about motivation, kind of carrots and sticks, or just having to grind it out. And there certainly have been a lot of um, developments in this over time. I found one model that I uh, that I really resonates with me uh, from a scientist uh, called DJ Fogg. He's a well-known social scientist and author from Stanford. So if bandwidth will catch up here. I'm going to stop my video for a second because I found that uh, these two things conflict. Glenn works in insurance, but he does not like his job. He wants a career in software development. So Glenn signs up for an online course to learn JavaScript. Did everyone hear that? Ten weeks. Glenn must do one hour of homework each day to pass. After week one, Glenn is super motivated. He does his homework and delivers his JavaScript project. Sorry, Andrew, you said that was choppy? Yeah, the audio is choppy. Okay. Okay. I can send that, uh, I can send that out uh, around to folks. Glenn works in insurance, but he does not like his job. He wants a career in software development. So Glenn signs up for an online course to learn JavaScript. The Glenn course needs, takes needs 10 to catch up here. Okay. Yeah, I'll just send out a link later to that. To sure, you. I will, yeah. Te yeah. Technology is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, long story short, so in that video, uh, the, um, the narrator talks about how motivation, uh, it, it's natural for motivation to, to wax and wane and, uh, and they describe, uh, behavior using a motivation, uh, times ability times a prompt or a trigger. And we'll revisit that here in a little bit with, uh, in a couple of slides. But long story short, if we think about motivation and we think about it in the context of a, of a, of a job seeker, uh, we've, most of us uh, who have been faced with needing to go out and, and figure out what's next, have experienced um, discouragement or, or difficulty staying motivated in the process. And in our own interviews, uh, not necessarily for my LSC work, but for our discovery processes with buoyancy, 80% of our job seekers had difficulty staying motivated and to some degree at one point in time felt discouraged and that's across the board. So we've seen that with folks who have a solid plan in place and they are uh, just kind of going through the process and executing We've seen folks that are super extroverted and networking all the time. And so it, it really expands the uh, various um, 
personality types and profiles as far as as far as that experience being quite shared. Um, and we've we've also looked online as part of our research, and. 20% of the threads in seven out of the top 10 Reddit job seeker communities, and I know that's not representative of the general population of the, uh, as a whole, but, uh, but, but seven out of the 10 Reddit job seeker communities have significant amount of talk about motivation challenges and negative sentiments. So I share that with you uh, just to, I guess, collectively help everyone realize that that's a pretty common and shared experience. Um, and I also hope that what we're, one of the takeaways from this uh, COVID and pandemic experience is that maybe in the past where uh, looking for a job and, and looking at career transition and um, the experience of unemployment as a whole uh, was something that wasn't particularly uh, normalized and didn't have a lot of, um, folks didn't necessarily have a lot of empathy toward that situation. And now because COVID has created this wide, uh, widespread shared experience that perhaps uh, this experience, although no less frustrating, will be a little bit uh, more normalized collectively in, in our society, particularly in Alberta. So, sorry, that was a bit of a, <laughs> a side, a side chatter. Let's get back to, uh, let's get back to the motivation and looking at, uh, looking at why. And we'll see if my slides will catch up here. Okay. So back to Rebecca. Rebecca's behavior seems completely irrational given the fact that she intended to focus on her job search that morning. Uh, this is called something called the intention action gap. And it refers to essentially the difference between what people say they would like to do or plan to do and what they actually do. Uh, so for example, I know with me, I always plan to exercise more, but I fail at that pretty regularly. Uh, I plan to eat better but I don't always follow through with my intentions on that. Um, and really the intention action gap is about people expressing a desire or an intent to do something and in the moment, just don't do that. And so if you look at the candy crush situation, oftentimes our brain is trying to find an easier path. We're drawn to more salient options, like when Siri suggests candy crush, then candy crush. Excuse me. Rebecca's behavior and all of our behavior can be explained by understanding the concept of the elephant and the rider. In the context of our decisions related to behavior, we can think of our brains as having kind of two parts. Now, these aren't two physical parts or two functional parts, but in simple terms, as it relates to behavior, we have these two parts of our brain. An automatic part that's effortless, unconscious, and emotional, and that handles 90% of the decisions we make. Then on the other side, we have a more deliberative, effortful and rational part of our brain that kind of handles the other 2%. NYU psychologist and author Jonathan Haidt uh, has suggested uh, a pretty clever analogy for this. He calls the emotional part of our brain the emotional elephant and the rider is the rational rider. There's a reasonable way to kind of describe the relationship between these two sides of our thinking. Uh, and if you kind of extend that a little bit, the rider believes that they're in charge, but when there's a disagreement, the elephant really always wins. So the rider can get exhausted trying to constantly direct the elephant and keep things moving in the right direction, particularly when the task or the, the path is unfamiliar or it's difficult or it's emotionally taxing. So in Rebecca's case, when she picked up her phone, the elephant recognized a familiar path and followed it without really alerting the rider uh, to the fact that anything was wrong. 
And as we talked about before uh, with the behavior model, the FOG behavior model, we can look at this entire process that produces behavior and it looks something like this. This is called the behavior chain. It's used as a tool in research and in uh, therapy and um, other contexts to help explain and investigate and research all behaviors. And really it's pretty simple. It starts with the trigger, which could be environmental, biological, mental, emotional, or social. You can have more than one trigger uh, acting at a, at a time. And of course, triggers then lead to thoughts. Thoughts can be automatic or they can be deliberative. And those thoughts lead to actions. And actions, which as we've seen with Rebecca, can also be somewhat automatic, uh, lead to consequences. So there are four distinct types of consequences and they all relate to responses in our minds and our body. Uh, there's physical consequences, physiological consequences, psychological consequences, or emotional consequences. And so if we look again at the Rebecca story, her intended behavior chain was to pick up the phone, look at her job listings, look at and apply for jobs, and then the consequence of that was that she was going to feel positive, accomplished, relieved. Instead, Siri's suggestion triggered the thought to open and play Candy Crush, which resulted in her feeling poorly for her choice. So it's, it's interesting. As an emotional consequence, we collectively often beat ourselves up when we experience this intention action gap. And a lot of times we'll attribute it to something wrong with our self-discipline or uh, you know, any number of things. But it's important to realize that for most of us, this kind of behavior path is, is largely automatic and perfectly rational given kind of the context that that automatic decision was made in. And it turns out that Rebecca is not alone. So if we look at the data, this chart, sorry, it's a little bit busy, uh, but there's research that on American time use studies that show that most unemployed job seekers spend the majority of their now free time on non-job search activities. So on average, they spend about an hour per day. <clears throat> now this is somewhat dated, so things could have changed. Uh, and certainly, I think the implications of, uh, of COVID and, uh, and the pandemic have skewed these numbers uh, in 2020 and early 2021, absolutely. Uh, having said that, I, so this data was from about seven or eight years ago. I would assert that, that social media has actually even claimed more of a, of a, uh, share of the, the total time. And this number may even be lower for, uh, for the average job seeker. <clears throat> and so it's important to ask why that might be given everything that we've learned so far. And so let's talk a little bit about what happens when individuals experience job loss. So job loss has profound impacts. Research has shown that job loss is equivalent to the loss of a loved one for potential impacts on your emotional and your physical well being. And we've also uh, found out through research that, that the, the stress of unemployment or the experience of unemployment can impact an individual's ability to think and act effectively. And sorry, this is a bit of a, a busy slide, but I wanted to put it up there. Um, this is research from back in the 80s uh, during the economic downturn. Social scientists wondered why the experience of unemployment has such significant negative impacts. So they looked at what secondary benefits employment brings us beyond financial gains. And it kind of seems like common sense but it's nice to have re <laughs> evidence uh, sitting behind the, the anecdotal evidence. 
and, and they found that beyond things like self-control and self-determination, which are really tied to uh, income and, and financial gains from unemployment, it's the other things that really started to matter. Uh, missing your social contract, or sorry, contact, having shared collective purpose, uh, social, gaining social status, a measure of your self-worth is tied to your, your employment. Uh, having structured time and having a steady stream of ongoing activity are all super important uh, secondary benefits that we get from the experience of employment. And so when we become unemployed, a lot of those things disappear and go away. We've also seen that even those with access to resources, so this isn't just a low socioeconomic condition. Uh, we've seen through research that even those with access to resources like outsourcing still feel loss due to uh, losing these secondary psychological benefits that employee, uh, employment provides. So if we think about what that does, and again, COVID-19 has absolutely exacerbated this, and I won't get into that in any detail. But the loss of these benefits also contribute to reduced self-esteem, uh, increased social isolation, social anxiety, and increased avoidance. So we could spend an entire hour on this slide alone, but let's move on and, and talk about the implications of that. So unemployment can contribute to something called a scarcity mindset. And I highly recommend this book if, uh, if you're interested in, in the topic that we're talking about. So beyond the uh, secondary benefits that we talked about, the scarcity mindset can create a tunneling effect. So when we face scarcity, whether it's social scarcity due to isolation of unemployment or COVID, income scarcity or opportunity scarcity, we may begin to see this shift in our mindset uh, described as a tunneling effect. And this tunneling effect limits an individual's ability to cope with everyday decisions. And we call that, or the authors have kind of labeled that as bandwidth. Scarcity has measurable impacts on situational intelligence. And scarcity reduces our ability to attend anything outside that tunnel. And the authors put it in a, a pretty concise way. When you focus on one thing, there's really just less share of mind to focus on anything else. As you devote more of your thinking to dealing with scarcity, uh, you have less, oh, I missed less, you have less share of mind for other things in your life. What's important though, especially in the context of something like uh, job search, some of those things that you need to do are pretty important to dealing with scarcity and moving on. That's why it's important to, to deal with the underlying challenges of uh, behavioral challenges before necessarily engaging in or alongside engaging in traditional job search activities. So if we look at this in a different way, the authors used a suitcase analogy to describe the impact of scarcity. And this isn't their exact story, but this is my version of the story. <clears throat> and so you're going away on vacation, you plan to do a lot of shopping when you get there and you pack your large suitcase so you leave lots of room. On the way down, your suitcase gets destroyed by the airline and they replace it with a carry-on that really just fits uh, only the clothes that you brought with you. And so all of a sudden, through no fault of your own, you find yourself in a scarcity situation. You have lack of slack. You have no room left in your suitcase. And now all of a sudden, shopping becomes more stressful. Oops. <laughs> there we 
we go. Sorry about that. All of a sudden, now you are kind of wringing your hands over this or that, trying to decide what thing it is that you're going to buy. Which will it be? It all of a sudden makes that decision so much more difficult. Having Slack in your suitcase makes it easier to pick. It reduces complexity. It reduces the costs, your cognitive costs. All of a sudden, if you, if you have that Slack or don't have that Slack and you're experiencing this tunneling effect, it takes more of your attention. It chews up more of your cognitive resources. It starts to impact your self-control and it starts to force you making trade-offs between this or that. And so if we put this into a different context, something maybe a little less uh, lighthearted, and look at it in kind of our, our regular lives. Research has shown that scarcity limits our ability to cope with everyday decisions. Using the analogy that we talked about from before, when faced with scarcity, our rider has difficulty engaging and really lets the elephant guide the way. In many of our professional lives, we've experienced something like time scarcity. So we have kind of overpromised on a bunch of work projects. Our kids have school activities. We're doing this and that. Our weekends are packed. Our evenings are packed. And something has to give. And all of a sudden, when somebody comes in with a new project, it's very, very difficult to think about and contemplate what you're going to do next. And so, but if we look at that in the context of other things like financial scarcity or opportunity scarcity, in, in better economic times, we individually and collectively kind of had our ups and downs, but we were able to cope with the various strains on our emotions and finances in general, um, because we had enough slack to respond to those other things, generally speaking, of course. But all of a sudden, when opportunities are not as readily available, this tunneling effect makes those things that are outside the tunnel seem less relevant and salient. The scarcity trap makes it very difficult to pay attention to anything outside the tunnel. So as job seekers, we need to tackle a set of tasks that are unfamiliar, generally. Many of us are inexperienced. And we're often uncertain about what are the next steps to take. Our confidence is low, our anxiety level is raised, and we're trying to figure this out maybe for the first time in our lives and often by ourselves. So we sit down and try to get ourselves organized sort of what step to take first. But in the context of this financial, social, and opportunity scarcity, all of a sudden these tasks become much more difficult to unravel. Uh, they're more difficult to plan, more difficult to pay attention to, and more difficult for us to maintain motivation for. But a lot of resources that you see out there that are focused on job seekers require considerable additional attention and share of mind to be able to take that information on board, synthesize it, integrate it, and apply it effectively to our own job search process. And for me, a great example is networking. Uh, broadly speaking, many of the folks that we've interviewed know that networking is one of the most effective ways to find your next opportunity. But it also tends to be uh, one of the least frequent exercises that people participate in. And I would suggest that partially, at least partially due to the scarcity trap and elevated isolation and anxiety, it's pretty unlikely that people who may not have been particularly social or good at networking in the past will now all of a sudden adopt that approach of being good networkers while experiencing elevated anxiety uh, and the impact of this scarcity trap. 
But I think it's also important to realize that given the context of the situation, those feelings are completely normal. And so how do we think about moving forward and dealing with scarcity? So there's three uh, keys to dealing with scarcity. Those are being able to expand bandwidth, increase slack, or reduce bandwidth consumption. So remember, bandwidth is how much room or how much slack we have, pardon me, in the system. So expanding bandwidth can be accomplished through policy or program design, which we largely don't have any control over uh, for the programs we participate in. But in the context of social scarcity, even just reaching out to our close contract contacts to rebuild that social bandwidth and that connection can help be the first step in that process. Increasing Slack is something, again, we, we may not be able to control in certain areas, but in the areas that we can control, like our well-being and our, our health, it's important to do that. So no surprise, things like sleeping well, eating well, taking care of yourself, getting your walks in, uh, which I don't do very well myself. Um, but that's all important because it, it, it gives you that sense of agency and, and control over the things that you can control. And to the degree that you can, plan your time and leave yourself lots of cushion in and around the activity that you're, uh, that you're doing. It's also important to reduce your bandwidth consumption. So things like breaking tasks down into bite-sized chunks and creating smaller decision points along the way. That helps make tasks more salient and easier. So if we kind of uh, pause and just recap to uh, about where we are, excuse me, my mouth is dry. We're back with Rebecca. So her elephant is in charge. She's facing scarcity and has low bandwidth. She's discouraged and her motivation is low. So how do we help her move forward? Rebecca's already learned how to manage the scarcity trap and increase her bandwidth. There's a couple of more tips that we can look at. One is shaping the path. Uh, which is about getting the rider and the elephant to agree. The second is appraising stress differently. So if we dive first into shaping the path by breaking things down and making them easier, we talked about that a little bit already, uh, overcoming the intention action gap with something called implementation intentions and making it stick with commitment devices. And then after we go through that, we'll chat about uh, appraising stress. Here's another video, which I'm going to skip. Hopefully, I'm going to skip. skip. There we go. So like the, like the video before, uh, <clears throat> that video reminded us that uh, behavior is motivation times ability times a trigger. And if we look at just the ability portion of this, the ability is comprised of uh, a number of things. So how much time or budget do you have to accomplish this thing? How much physical effort will it take? How much mental effort will it take? Or is this task routine? And so in the previous video, there was a woman named Carmen, and, and she wasn't really interested in taking the time, the physical or mental effort to prep her food, her veggies. It wasn't really routine. But she did have the budget to make the path easier by finding pre-washed veggies and uh, making her prep time easier. So let's look at a couple of different ways that we can change that behavioral equation uh, in your favor. Oops. Go back one here. Okay, sorry, a bit of a busy slide. Implementation intentions. 
So implementation intentions are there to help you overcome that um, intention action gap that we talked about before. And really it's as simple as creating if then plans that preset how you're going to act in certain situations related to your goal. Your plans essentially and small, we're talking small chunks of plans get reframed as if then statements. So for example, if I feel like I'm going to hit the snooze button in the morning, I jump right out of bed and splash water on my face. Uh, or if I feel tempted to eat a cookie, I'll, I tell myself that in that situation, I'm going to hide the package out of sight. So really, they're about predefining when, where, and how you want to act in relation to that goal. And to build them, it's literally just fill in the, the blanks. If this, then I will do that but doing it beforehand to align your elephant and your rider to say, okay, that's the path we're going to take. So putting these implementation intentions in place follows a pretty simple process. Choose a small goal that you want to accomplish, whether it's related to your job search or not. Uh, think about ways to achieve the goal I also think about what obstacles might be in your way to stop you and then put your ideas and obstacles into your then plans. The other important part is teeing yourself up and making sure that your work area is prepared or your task area, whatever it might be, is prepared ahead of time. So if we look at Rebecca, she set herself up with some implementation intentions that say, when I get up in the morning, I'll immediately do my yoga. And she has her yoga gear all set up and ready to go. If she opens her laptop in the morning, uh, sorry, from Rebecca's point of view, she says, if I open my laptop in the morning, I'll complete two job applications before checking email or social media. So really it's about ensuring that her focus is on the tasks, the goals that she wants to do before putting those distractions off to the side and acknowledging that they're the distractions and, and, and having the elephant and the rider align and say, I'm going to do these two things first. I'm going to follow this path first before I veer off. Okay, so the second part of that is commitment devices. And commitment devices, again, we've named them here. They're probably pretty familiar to you. It's a way to help you follow a plan of action. It helps you close that intention action gap as well and align the rider and the elephant. So an example, putting your credit card in the freezer if you spent too much. You, uh, you've committed to not spending more. You've taken action. Uh, in the form of an ice cube to give yourself some, some cool down time before you spend that credit card. Uh, the second example, uh, money versus muffins, is a real world example that happened. A workmate of mine was, uh, was traveling, heading on vacation, and they decided that muffins were the source of their uh, extra weight gain. And so I said, hey, you know what? I just learned about this. Let's try a commitment device. And I said, okay, is there a politician or a political party that you absolutely despise out there in the world? And this person said, yes, there's a political party back home that I, that I hate. And I said, very good. You write a check to that political party, seal it in an envelope, and we'll address it to them and we'll put a stamp on it. And then we'll give it to uh, individual B over here to hold it in their desk. And if anybody here catches you eating muffins for breakfast, then that check goes in the mail. And I was somewhat skeptical as to whether or not this was going to work, but it absolutely worked. So for three months, this guy did not eat a muffin for breakfast. And yeah, I was, I was amazed. So commitment devices do work. There's a website out there actually called stick.com uh, where you can nominate yourself a referee and, and do all this 
uh, online. Not necessarily uh, the right commitment device for supporting your job search, but interesting. From a, a job search perspective, two of the most effective commitment devices are pretty simple, actually. One is just about making it social, so telling someone else about what your intentions are, and not necessarily just your um, just your if then statements, but any part of your plan. Then whether you're committing to a spouse or whether you're committing to an accountability partner and another job seeker uh, or, or a pal, just making it social helps build that commitment device in place. The other one that you could potentially do is, is writing it down and also writing it down and sharing it. So those are two great options to give you simple commitment devices to, to moving your plan forward. Okay, so the second piece beyond, the, so all of that was part of shaping the path. The second piece that I just wanted to share with you is about reevaluating stress. And this is really interesting, uh, or at least I find it interesting. I hope you guys do as well. So this, uh, I'll take you through information from a pretty recent study actually called Beliefs Count Twice, how to harness the human stress response to promote well-being. And it's really, really pretty fascinating. Um, no surprise to folks on this call that anxiety and stress can contribute to people feeling overwhelmed and potentially avoid challenges. But what the researchers are asserting is that we don't necessarily need to avoid stress. We need to try and stay engaged in some of the activities that are causing stress and that the way we evaluate or appraise the demands related to that stress and the stress response itself can have a big impact on how we respond to, uh, to these challenges. <clears throat> so let's look at this. Uh, the researchers, uh, Professor, sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> Professor Carol Dweck, who established early studies related to fixed and growth mindsets. Uh, teamed up with David Yeager, uh, a professor from UT Austin. And I, I think the work that they're doing is, is pretty important. It extends that mindset approach uh, to make it a little more tangible. And as we talked about, they're talking about, um, or they looked into how we evaluate stress responses and how we can start to think about stress in a new way. So when we're faced with a stressful task, like writing a cover letter or going into an interview, our body responds in a pretty predictable way. You know, our heart rate elevates, our palms get sweaty, we feel anxious. Our brains and body are essentially getting prepared to either fight or run away. What research has shown us is that it matters how we elevate the stress response. If we think about stress as a natural response to this kinds of situation, kind of situation, then, then we can potentially shift the outcome. So in this example, uh, I don't know if this was Rebecca or not, but in this example, we're going to an interview and we start to feel stressed. So it matters how we appraise the event itself. Uh, so for example, many of us are super nervous about going into interviews, I'm terrible at this. There's a lot of self-talk that's going on. but it also matters how we appraise the stress. So it's kind of a two-stage process. How do we appraise the event and how do we appraise the stress? So if you think about stress and say, oh, I'm a ball of stress, I'm too stressed to do this, I can't, I, you know, I can't do this, and I'm going to fail. When we evaluate stress negatively, our body responds appropriately. So our blood flow gets constricted how we're, uh, we're not getting as much oxygen to our brain. So if we have reduced cognitive capacity, we feel poorly, we have increased anxiety, we have increased avoidance and decreased overall motivation. So when we appraise our stress response as negative, we actually are making it more difficult to perform. However, if we prepare ourselves and know that the situation or task is successful, or sorry, stressful, you can change the way 
that you appraise um, the stress reaction or that influences the way you appraise the stress reaction. And you can think about it as the body's way of helping you get prepared for taking on a challenge. So what happens if we evaluate the event and the stress response as positive? The research shows that we start to see the opposite effect. Our body gets flush with blood. We have increased cognitive capacity. We start to feel more positive. We have decreased anxiety, uh, increased approach and increased approach motivation. So really what you're doing is you're, you're, you're pumping more blood. Uh, you are getting yourself prepared. And they call this the stress can be enhancing mindset. And I don't actually think their paper is fully published yet, uh, but fantastic and interesting piece of, of work. And not completely surprising. I think for many of us, these pieces of, of research have a lot of intuition uh, that we all share around some of these things, but it's great to have the, the hard data to go with it. So as the researchers say, when your mind expects you to rise to meet the challenge, rather than feeling anxious, you're feeling more confident and you're ready to take on the challenge. Okay, so just a little over time, but today we took you through three things. Motivation, how and why it fluctuates up and down how your elephant and your rider are often at odds and how that can lead to this intention action gap and how the loss of those secondary benefits like social connections and collective purpose can lead to the scarcity trap and tunneling in our brains. We also talked about three ways to move forward. Uh, we talked about how you can reduce bandwidth required by, uh, by a task or a group of tasks by breaking things down and making them easier. We talked about how you can shape the path for your elephant, your rider, with things like implementation intentions and commitment devices. And lastly, we talked about how adopting a stress can be enhancing mindset can help you reframe and reevaluate stress, then help you prepare for your next challenge. Uh, so I hope that was interesting. Um, there's a lot of meat around each of those subjects that, uh, that we, um, I'm happy to chat with anybody at any time. Um, I do want to say thank you to Allison and uh, Andrew and the rest of the team at the Goldmine Project for inviting me again. Um, I believe that the Goldmine Project and their work continues to be a really important way for us to collectively maintain those social connections and the collective purpose of moving forward as a city. Um, and I guess lastly, if you are in the process of looking for a job or looking at a career change, we'd love to speak to you as part of our customer discovery process. We're reaching out to as many job seekers as we can and, uh, and trying to build each of those voices into the, the products that we're developing for the future. So my email's uh, on there on the slide feel free to uh, shoot me a note if you want to participate or just grab a coffee. Um, and as well, if you are looking for us on Wine, uh, we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram at Buoyancy Works, uh, on LinkedIn at Buoyancy-Works, uh, or our websites are Buoyancy.Works, and we have a beta uh, web app out there in the world right now uh, called Nudge Jobs, and that's at nudgejobs.com. Thanks very much. I guess back to you, Andrew. Okay, well, thank you, John. I appreciated all the information that you put forward. Um, two things that, that stuck in my mind from what you said was um, that networking is the best option to get a job. Um, so often we hear this, and, and I know that I struggle with, with doing that. Uh, it's so much easier just to you know, apply online to jobs, but really the better success is uh, is in the networking. And so thank you for driving that point home. And uh, <clears throat> also useful is is the suggestion to have job search accountability. You know, we, we try to create a community of people at the gold mine and 
try to facilitate, you know, connections through these webinars. But um, for those people that don't have uh, have a, a buddy, um, yeah, it'd be great to great to find one in the community here or, or some other way to uh, encourage you in your in your journey. Absolutely. Um, before we do the Q and A, we do have a question. Uh, oh, from, from the audience, they wanted to know: Is this similar similar to my preference to work on my personal business rather than doing doing job search? Um, yeah, thanks, Allison, for that. Uh, before we do that, I was just going to do the quick poll. I will do the okay. poll, and then we'll get into the Q and A. Yep. Okay, thanks, Allison. Um, I have four four short questions for you, and it might take you uh, a minute. Um, just to do that, I'll leave it open for, for a minute and then we can jump into the Q&A. Hopefully people are seeing that on their screen. Yep. That question's wrong. Oh, the question's wrong? Uh -oh. It should say find work in 2021. Yeah, that's the second question. So you're gonna have to scroll well, down to get to the four questions. They may need to word it right differently, maybe. <laughs> okay. This is our first attempt to, to do this. So. A couple, couple more seconds here. For those. Uh... Okay. Thank you for your responses. I'm going to end the polling and uh, turn it over to, turn it over to questions. Um, here's the here's the results. We had um, uh, six is the top answer in number one, uh, eight and nine in number two. Yes, number three and yes, number four. So thank you for that. Well, uh, it's good to see that there's more motivation this year. Yeah, definitely. It seems to be a new thing. There's more motivation this year. People. After this lockdown, people really feel like they're ready to go and get going. So yeah. there's a new enthusiasm, I noticed. For this sure. Year. Yeah. So I'm um, getting back to that question that, that Allison pointed out. It said, is, uh, is this similar to my preference to work on my personal business rather than doing a job search? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I wouldn't suggest that uh, anything we talked about was specific to preferences. Uh, there are certainly individual differences that can drive people's preferences one way or another. But if I shift the question a little bit and answer the question about is it similar to an individual's motivation to, uh, to working on their job, their, sorry, their, their own uh, business, I think it's absolutely applicable. Um, I can see parallels in my own world, <laughs> and I know data point of one, but I can see parallels in my own world as, uh, as we slowly build uh, and bootstrap buoyancy from the ground up um, that are absolutely aligned with uh, the challenges I felt in 2015 uh, as, a, as a job seeker. So I think, I think the parallels are certainly there. And it all ties down to some similar experiences. Early on, I was uh, I didn't have a team of folks helping me with buoyancy. I, I do now, but I felt uh, quite isolated. And um, it wasn't until I 
I reached out to other folks in the startup community that some of that started to um, get addressed, I guess. Um, and yeah, certainly all of the motivational pieces that we talked about here uh, can, can impact entrepreneurs and anyone else that's out there who's had a, an entrepreneurial experience who wants to weigh in. I'm happy to hear from anyone else as well. Great. Um, <clears throat> what about, uh, said, said thoughts about gamification of job search? Brilliant question. <laughs> uh, so I absolutely think there's ways to, to uh, gamify uh, job search. Uh, certainly part of that are the, the things that we talked about with implementation intentions and, um, and commitment devices. If you're thinking specifically about technology, that's a big part of how we're thinking about uh, applying behavioral science in our Nudge Jobs platform and the, the tools that we're putting together for buoyancy. Uh, certainly, I'm a big believer in gamification uh, to the degree that it's, it's applied correctly. Uh, there is some risk of over gamifying things that start to take some of that intrinsic motivation off of the table. So there's there's a balance there. Um, but yeah, I absolutely think that uh, if, if you're trying to apply some of these techniques to the job search and do it for a large population at scale, then gamification has a, a seat at that table for sure. Great, any, any comments to consider the impact um, of motivation and how long you've been in the job search mode. Yeah, there's, um, I, I don't have specific research to, um, to point to in this, other than we know that over time, uh, as individuals are in, uh, in the job search past kind of 12 months, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to continue to stay motivated and stay engaged. Having said that, I think 2020 and 2021 will be the exception to that rule because there is such softness and global demand and, and, and we are, or was, I guess, and we're now starting to see that, uh, that shift. It almost feels to me like it's a bit of a, a restart and a, a good opportunity for us collectively to consider this as a restart because 2020 was such an exception to the pattern. Uh, and so there is some literature to say that uh, depending on the, the, the duration, uh, but a whole host of other factors as well, uh, that certainly can can impact your motivation. So I, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but <clears throat> feel free to drop me a line if you want to chat about it uh, again. Um, just a, a comment, a follow-up comment on the gamification, now that I pronounce it properly. Uh, gamification might demotivate some people depending on some of their other personality traits. That is true. I agree. That's why there needs to be a, a, a balance for sure. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at from a personalization perspective is, um, is uh, balancing the plan and the interface with the tools based on an individual's uh, personality uh, traits and individual differences. Having said that, not even close to that right now. So all kind of floating around in the back of my of my head. Cool. Does anybody have any more questions? Um, we're, uh, we're caught up on the questions in the chat box. Feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you have a question. Anybody nope. want to uh, ask about, sorry, was there somebody else? No, go ahead. 
Yeah, if you want to ask any questions too about kind of my background or the program at the LSC, uh, behavioral economics or behavioral science in general, um, happy to chat about any of that. Hi, John. My name is Rob. Um, where does he play in, uh, in job search and some of the um, attributes of, of job search in your research? Mr. Bauhaus, can you repeat the question? You cut out at the beginning there. Hi. Hi, John. Good to see you again. <laughs> hey, uh, where does age play in kind of the role of, of some of the, uh, uh, you know, solutions and, and some of the things you talked about with bandwidth, path, and, and, uh, and mindset? Uh, that's a great question, Rob. I I can't speak specifically to, to the implications of age uh, in relation to the things that you brought up from a research perspective. I, I just don't have that data at my fingertips. Um, I have a theory that I suggest that, that over time, as you get more comfortable with the kinds of experiences that we're talking about, um, they do become more familiar and you do, uh, I guess there's a potential for you to be less prone to some of the things that we talked about uh, with that experience. Uh, so on that side, I would say that's good. I think the other good news about, uh, about aging is there's a, uh, a pretty famous U-shaped happiness curve that goes along with it. And so overall, once you at least in North America, um, you know, Western Western economies, I guess, if we kind of think about it that way, there's this U-shaped curve that, that shows that uh, once we kind of crest 50 to 55, our overall happiness and subjective well-being starts to increase. So it's, it's pretty high when we're young and then kind of slowly gets lower and lower until we hit uh, a middle age and then we start to get happier again. So I actually think, Rob, that that would be a huge contributor to um, people's outlook and, and um, contribution to their overall motivation. Cool. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple more questions in the chat box. Um, now, now, motivation, I guess you could think of it in terms of motivation for job search or motivation in general in your life. But as one approaches retirement, does the motivation change in any way? I guess the job search part would. <laughs> That's a really, uh, a really good question. Um, again, I don't have specific research to reference about that as you approach retirement. Um, I think it would largely depend on what resources you have available to you and the um, and what your own plan is toward retirement. Now I know a lot, an awful lot of people who are really motivated to take just one more swing at this thing, whatever this thing might be. Um, and so I, I guess I reflect back on my earlier comments. I think, I think with, uh, with age, you have a little more experience and, and perspective. Um, having said that though, I. I certainly, if I reflect back on my own experience in 2015, uh, some of the individuals that, that felt the greatest despair at that time were, were folks that were, were late in their career. So, um, yeah, s certainly we've had mixed, mixed results in some of the interviews and conversations that we've had with, with folks that, that are at or near uh, retirement. Um, like I say, some are really interested in, in kind of getting after it one more time. Others have found solutions where they've uh, teed up bits of contract work and that's really intended to bridge them until they're ready to, uh, to retire. Thanks, John. Um, perhaps people, if people have in-depth um, questions about you and your, and your company, Buoyancy Works, they can um, follow up with you directly. But just on a highlight, uh, what, what can um, 
Buoyancy Works uh, do for people that are looking for jobs? Well, right, <laughs> right now, Andrew, the best I can, uh, I can offer is, uh, is my own expertise and, uh, and certainly connecting with, um, with us for a discovery interview. Uh, we do have nudge jobs out there um, as a, a platform of tools. And right now it's absolutely free. So if folks want to sign up and log in and give it a go, that's, that's fair. Um, happy to have any and all feedback. Having said that, I would say that uh, Nudge Jobs in its current form is really much, uh, very much focused on the, uh, on reducing the barriers to engagement by providing a plan engine and a task management and job opportunity management tool set. I suspect going forward in our next version, uh, it'll be much more focused on the behavioral and the motivational pieces. And so um, feel free to, to use the tools. We're happy for sure for anyone to go in there and, uh, and give them a go. We expect by kind of late spring or summer that we'll have a, a completely different version out there that's, uh, that we hope will help tackle some of these fundamental challenges around scarcity and motivation. Okay. Thanks, John. So you have, uh, um, I guess, a career similar to mine. I, I was laid off in 2015, and it sounds like you were as well, uh, from the oil and gas industry. Um, so how difficult was it for you to leave uh, the oil patch and transition into uh, what you're doing now? Did you have any self-doubt? <laughs> uh, always. Always self-doubt. I think in every in every jump on my career journey, there's always been uh, been self doubt. This one was a, a a big one, Andrew. But for me, it was also about um, recognizing and realizing that the first twenty years of my career were pretty damn good, and uh, I had a lot of awesome experiences. Uh, but also recognizing, I think that for many of us, the writing was on the wall and so I started to look at, at other options and other opportunities and I think the most difficult part of that process was doing the career counseling uh, exercise and, and stepping through that, that emotional journey and that really I guess gave me permission or it felt like I gave myself permission to engage in, in something that was going to allow me to do something really fun and interesting for the last back half of my career. So my act two, I guess. Um, so yeah, am I, do I still, I can't remember exactly the phrasing that you, you used, but um, yeah, still fairly terrified, even today, talking about my new uh, areas of expertise with this group, so. Yeah, I, I guess the, the question was, was it difficult to uh, to leave the oil patch? And you, you pointed out that, yeah, you had some good times, but you saw the writing on the wall and needed to do something different, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it was both um, coming to the recognition that I was relatively industry agnostic, um, and not to suggest that the uh, that the patch didn't provide me with great uh, a great degree of privilege uh, that actually allowed me to set the table for what it is that I'm doing now. I absolutely recognize that, but I also wanted to look at ways to um, pull those threads that were most interesting out of my career journey so far and stitch them together into something new. Great. So any more last minute questions before we, uh, before we end the session? Okay, well, I guess not, we'll, um, we'll uh, wrap it up. Thank you again, John, for all the information and, and for the presentation. I learned a lot about what you do and um, I'm more interested in, in uh, behavioral science. Actually, I, I have a book, it's called, um, um, I can't remember what it's called now. It's, it's a book on change. It talks about the elephant and the rider. It's a very interesting, very interesting book. Very good. 
maybe I'll chat about you, chat with you about it later. Sure, I'm well, happy so, to share my reading list with anyone. I appreciate <laughs> being here. So, can you just confirm your uh, your website? I think it's buoyancy.works. That's correct. Buoyancy.works. Okay, and um, we'll we'll be sending out all of the links that John talked about, uh, the video links, and hopefully a copy of his slides. And I'll be posting uh, this video on our YouTube channel and providing a link to that as well. So, thank you everyone for your time. And oh, John. We'll We'll look forward to seeing you at our next session. Thanks, Ange. Yeah. All right. See you soon. Take care, everyone. Bye now.